I'd like to call the uh, April 13th meeting of the City Planning Commission to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Vandersteen? Here. Alderperson Boren? Here. Ryan Sazma? Here. Jerry Jones? I think he's excused. Marilyn Montemeyer? Here. David Hoffman? Here. Don Svitan? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, next, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First, next we'll introduce the uh, committee members and staff. Jim, would you start? Good afternoon, everyone. Alderman Jim Warren of the 3rd District, and I'm the Alderman of the Plan Commission. Uris, building inspection. Mike Vandersteen, mayor and chairman. Chad Pelishek, planning director. Steve Sokolowski from the planning department. Marilyn Montemayor, citizen member. Uh, Ryan Sazza, the Department of Public Works. John Sweetan, commission member. Well, welcome everyone. Does anybody have any potential conflicts of interest with <coughs> items on the agenda? Seeing none, then we'll... Uh, Go on to the minutes, uh, asking for a motion to approve the Planning Commission minutes from March 23rd. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. And then we'll move on to items for discussion and possible action. Item 3.1 is an application for conditional use and sign permit with exceptions by the Sheboygan Area School District to install new signage at North High School located at 2926 North 10th Street. Steve? All right, thanks, Mayor. We have uh, Joel Vollmer from the school district here, as well as Dan Stangle, the athletic director from North High. So what we're taking a look at tonight is some signage proposed for North High School at 2926 um, North 10th Street. You can see on the uh, uh, TV and the screens in terms of the, the signage that's proposed. Um, one of the goals that North is trying to do is build together, uh, uh, tying a building together that opened in 1961 with a consistent branding carried through the curricular and co-curricular areas of their campus. There's been countless additions built onto the school throughout the years and different signage and branding and logos are found throughout their campus. So one of the things that uh, North is looking at doing is doing some rebranding throughout the school in addition to the sign uh, to, to have a similar uh, Golden Raider uh, branding uh, to it. When visitors come to the school, for major events, um, North is looking to identify something that's easily recognizable as a landmark so that they can uh, direct them to the commons uh, by the large Raider mural on School Avenue. So it'll be very recognizable to those both visitors as well as uh, uh, potential new students and alumni to understand where they would like them to enter the school. Uh, in summary, we want their students and community to feel a sense of school spirit and pride when they come to the school. We want younger students to choose North High School and look forward to becoming Golden Raiders. We want their <laughs> alumni to be proud of the school they've graduated from. And a sense of ownership and pride is one of the most powerful tools they have at the school. And with consistent branding throughout the campus, we can get closer to accomplishing these ideals. The sign on the front displays uh, a large Raider logo that states home of the Golden Raiders. There are a couple of variances involved in this matter to install a 596 square foot window sign and to have more wall signage than what is permitted. Um, again, in addition to the signage on the exterior of the window, there are other attachments showing how the same branding is being utilized throughout the interior of the schools and staff was not, uh, was recommending approval of the uh, sign uh, subject to the conditions you have before you and the applicants are here. Thank you very much, Steve. Would the applicant like to make any other comments? Mm -hmm. You step up to the podium. Dan Stengel, uh, Athletic Director at North, and just wanted to add, last night we had a football game at North, and again, with um, our high school opening in 1961 and various additions, 
We have people coming to all different doors, all different parts of the school. Last night, even at the football game, we got the visitors coming in the home gate and things. So we're really just trying to, whether it's a high school event, a youth event, whatever we're hosting at North, say come to the Raider Head. This is you know where you drop off, whether it be a football game, a basketball game, um, for graduation and things like that. So we're really trying to tie together the building and have uh, this distinctive spot to direct people uh, to, to come to our events. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Commissioners, any uh, discussion or questions? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve along with the staff recommendation. Second that. Thank you for that motion and support. That's before us. One last call for any discussion. Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Vandersteen? Aye. Alderperson Boren? Aye. Ryan Sazma? Aye. Marilyn Montemeyer? Aye. David Hoffman? Aye. Don Svitan? Aye. All ayes. Motion passes. Good luck with your project. It looks great. Item 3.2 is an application for a conditional use and sign permit with exceptions by American Orthodontics to install new signage at 3524 Washington Avenue. Steve, do you have a report on this? Yeah, I'm not sure if there's anyone from American Orthodontics on the telephone. We are. Uh, so representing American Orthodontics, this is Mike Terrell. Blizzard. Okay, Steve, you want to proceed with sure, your report? Thanks for attending, guys. Yes, Mayor, thank you. Um, what we're taking a look at is um, American Orthodontics is in, uh, proposing to install new signage at their property located at 3524 Washington Avenue. Um, American Orthodontics, which has operated in the city since its inception in 1968, is seeking permission to utilize their existing assets to recruit employees through signage in their parking lot. Um, their proposed signs will be printed on a vinyl substrate and will hang from their existing parking light poles. There are currently 16 light poles in the parking lot and each one of the light posts will host two banners, each being approximately 12.5 square feet. So it's about a total of 400 square feet of signage with 32 signs located throughout the um, parking lot. And the style of the sign and color scheme will be consistent with their branding. The banners initially would be used to encourage people to apply for employment at American Orthodontics and will be replaced as the result of normal wear and tear or to change a message in the event as they achieve their hiring goals. There's no set schedule to rotate the messaging out, but our alternate banners will very likely be brand oriented and will be displayed throughout the year. Going forward, the light pole banners will be changed periodically to, uh, to display their brand. Um, and I'm sure the applicants can speak to a little bit more about uh, what they're trying to accomplish with um, the signage. Uh, there are a couple of variances involved um, to install 16 sets of 12 <laughs> 0.5 square foot banners, so 32 temporary banners, average, uh, 32 temporary banners totaling 40, 400 square feet, and to install temporary banners for more than 30 days. And staff did not was not objecting to the proposal and was recommending approval. And I can answer any questions. And the applicants are online. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, would the applicants from American Orthodontics like to add anything to that presentation? Uh, no, Steve did a great job. Great. Uh, commissioners, any discussion? Alderperson Bourne? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would make a motion to approve subject to staff recommendations. Second. Uh, okay, under discussion. Marilyn, did you have anything? Yeah, yes, thank you. I was wondering if the, the illustrations of the banners will will be used when you do the banners. That's the entertainment and joy of teeth. I love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the graphics that you're looking at are representative of what will be put up um, on our light post. Very good, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Um, please call the roll. Mayor Vandersteen? Aye. Alderperson Boren? Ryan Sazma? Aye. Marilyn Montemeyer? Aye. David Hoffman? Aye. Don Svitan? Aye. All ayes. Motion passes. Good luck with your project. Thank you. Hope, hope you can get yep, those uh, you. applicants you need. Thank you, guys. Yep, bye-bye. Thank you.
Okay, next we'll move on to item 3.3, which is an application for a conditional use with exceptions by Lewis Holbrook to construct a new second floor apartment at 635 Riverfront Drive. Steve? Thanks, Mayor. Um, Lewis Holbrook is here, and he is the owner of the uh, Riverfront Shanty located at 635 Riverfront Drive. And this and the first floor of this shanty, we presently have uh, TLC Casuals, which has been located there for more than 25 years, a women's clothing store. Uh, the second floor space is vacant and has been occupied for some time, and this space was previously used for storage. Uh, the Holbrooks are looking to improve this space to provide occupancy as a one-bedroom loft-style apartment and the improvements would not result in any modification of the exterior of the building. <clears throat> the most significant part of the improvements would be the installation of a kitchen and soundproofing of the floor, and the space as constructed would be about 2,400 square feet. The improvement would provide a unique loft-style residential unit in this attractive downtown riverfront location. Um, it's staff's understanding that, sp that this space has been vacant for a little while, and the staff and the plan commission have been encouraging downtown living and the proposed conversion provides additional housing opportunities in this downtown riverfront location. Uh, Mr. Holbrook will be taking advantage of a city program that helps fund underutilized second floor space into a new, new housing opportunities in downtown Sheboygan. And Abby, Abby Block is here from the planning department who helps work on that program. So she's been working with Lewis as well. The applicant will need to work with the building inspection department regarding the conversion of the second floor space into apartments and occupancy would only be granted at such time that permits and codes have been met. So I can answer any questions, the applicants here and there is a neighbor here for this one as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Holbrook, would you like to add anything to that discussion? Um, just basically that we've owned this property for a while. When it was first built, our intention was to have a second floor residential unit on it. Um, it just never kind of made financial sense to us. Um, now the city of Sheboygan is offering a, a um, grant program that caters directly towards what we've got. So at the end of the day, it makes sense now. And it's something that we've just used for storage and has been just <coughs> sitting there. So why not have it where we can have a place where people can live and enjoy the riverfront downtown? Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And I'm looking for your approval today. Could you describe the amount of money you're going to be investing in this second floor remodel? Uh, total about 80000 Okay, That's thank what it'll you. be at the end of the day. Very good. M Attorney Roth, did you have some comments you wanted to make? Uh, Please come up to the podium. And right by the door. Yes, thank you. Um, as the owner of Unit C, which is the upper floor of uh, 641 Riverfront Drive, so we are, actually, we're a more direct neighbor than the first, uh, first floor of our building. In any case, as originally intended, um, all the units down there, there were no residences uh, that were ever planned when these buildings were built. And we're concerned that the changing it to residential now, even, even the upper, when the intent when the buildings were built was to be office or re office upstairs, retail downstairs. I'm fairly certain our building would never have been approved if we, if we had, had intended it to use it as residential. And we are concerned uh, already that the, that the neighborhood, so to speak, has changed its character from what the intent was, and that is retail and offices. And, uh, Basically, as a neighbor, you're always concerned about potential property values, and I don't, I don't see that this is a con contribution to the neighborhood. Thank you very much for those comments. Mr. Holbrook, would you like to speak? Session. Okay. Any other questions or discussion amongst the commissioners? Entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve subject to staff recommendations. And I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there any other discussion? Chad, could you talk a little bit about uh, the different things that were brought up 
and as far as the, the city goals in this area? Well, I don't know what the, I don't know that I know the goals prior, but I can tell you that the, the redevelopment authority and the city has long tried to get residences on the second floor if there, if residences need to be there. So we've had a lot of discussion about that on South Pier. We've got a couple examples on South Pier where we've got people living on the second floor and have commercial on the first floor. So, um, you know, I, people are interested in wanting to live in the downtown. I think what we have going for us and the value here is the fact that it's a one uh, unit, 2,400 square foot um, a rental unit that, you know, is probably gonna have you know, one or maybe two people in it. Um, so, I, I, you know, I don't know, there's there's plenty of parking down there. I, I, you know, I think having, you know, more live, work, play and those types of options down there makes sense. So I, I don't know that city development staff is, is against this. I think, you know, we've been, we've developed a program to help incentivize people to take these underutilized spaces and build them out into additional housing opportunities. And um, we all know, we'll find out in a little bit, we all know that we need a lot of more housing in this community and you know this is one way of getting there. Thank you for those comments, uh, Steve. Yeah, I think, I think <coughs> Mr. Roth probably has some fair comments in terms of some of the original development. I think that there has been some living units. Um, the shanty next to the Harbor Winds at one point in time had a number of residential units on the third floor. I think those have been since converted into offices. But I think the main goal, as, as Mr. Roth was saying, is to have retail, and that retail is to be on the first floor so that it's open 24-7 and just like on the South Pier, um, we allow for offices and residential because they're more service oriented and being five, eight to five during the week and having more of that activity on the weekends of retail, restaurant and things like that on the first floor. So I think this is definitely something that uh, it, Mr. Holbrook has indicated he's spending $80,000 as far as into a reinvestment. So from a property value standpoint, I would think this would only enhance things down there. So staff is definitely recommending approval of this and would look for and would do the same if others are interested. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Ryan? Yeah, I did, and I think I think Chad hit it right in the head. This is one unit we're talking about. So it's not it's not a bunch of units. And like Steve mentioned, you want this kind of activity down in this area. So having having uh, some residential in this area makes sense. Dave Hoffman? Um, Mr. Holbrook, did you uh, make an effort to rent this space out in the recent past? So we have. You got to come to the podium. You got to come to the podium. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, we have. And we have had a few businesses in there. The unfortunate thing is, is it's because it's on a second floor and there's no elevator to get up there. Really, most businesses aren't interested in being in that space. So it's really not set up to have people coming in and out of it because it is on a second floor. Um, and that's really the, been the issue. As far as a residential unit, it's not an issue. You know. Um, I would like to add that I am just as concerned about the neighborhood as anyone else. We happen to own the lower level of the building that Attorney Roth is in. So we care just as much as, any, we have just as much interest in keeping this nice as, as anybody. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing no discussion, oh, please call the roll. Mayor Vandersteen? Aye. Holder Person Board? Aye. Ryan Sazma? Marilyn Lowen Montemayor? Aye. Dave Hoffman? Aye. Don Svitan? Aye. All ayes. Motion passes. Thank you, Thank you for uh, looking at this project. Next, we'll move on to item 3.4, which is resolution number 193 of 2021 by all the persons <coughs> born receiving the City of Sheboygan's Affordable Housing Market Study prepared by MSA Professional Services Incorporated and encouraging staff to take action to implement the findings, strategies, and recommendations of the study. I'll turn it over to our planner, Chad Pelichek, for an introduction to this program and study. Thank you. Chad? Just a minute, I'm trying to get a PowerPoint up. There we go. There we go. So. Sorry, Alderman Bourne, you're gonna see this again, but for the Planning Commission, um, the this is, we commissioned a study back in, starting in October of last year with uh, hiring of MSA 
consultants to look at the affordable housing needs of this community. Um, we, there was a presentation done uh, with the consultant at the council meeting a week ago, and there'll be a public presentation tomorrow at 5 p.m. Um, on GoToMeeting that if any of you are interested in uh, logging into that, let me know and I'll get you the contact or you can get it off the city's website. But what we're doing is kind of running through the, the findings of this study. So we know that all of us have been involved with a number of housing developments from market rate to single family to affordable, but we've heard over and over and over again out of community surveys the need for additional affordable housing units. So we wanted to understand a little bit more about what is that market, what are those requirements, and what, you know, what do we need to do and how many units do we need to develop. So this, this presentation that I'm gonna run through quickly is, is, was put together by MSA, but um, looking at the background of the community, um, what you'll see in the graph on the left is that our population is projected to decrease um, continually, kind of up a little bit in 2020 and 2025, and then back down in 2020, 2040. The other interesting thing with the graph on the right is that we're gonna see a substantial increase in 65 to 84 years old and 85 and older. So our population is gonna be growing older as we move into the 2040 timeframe. When we look at median and per capita income, so Sheboygan, the city of Sheboygan compared to the surrounding areas is relatively lower. Um, our median household income is the lowest in the county at $48,313, as well as the per capita income is, is low at 24,000 compared to surrounding communities. Um, and a couple comments, many residents face income limitations, lower wages in uh, the study area com uh, compared to other areas. However, we do, they do project an you know, employment growth and we've seen that from a number of manufacturers across the county. So they're still looking at a 4% increase in this region. And then the weighted average salary for most in-demand occupations is around 50,000. So when we look at the building permits that were issued, that's been issued for the last five years, um, you can see that we have seen um, a, a rise in duplexes and that's primarily related to the way the number of units were developed, um, Kingsbury, uh, development that recently opened, those were developed as duplexes. It was a way of getting around some uh, requirements in the building code. But you can see from this chart that the single family housing on the top has been relatively slow and we're hoping that's gonna pick up with this new subdivision that we've all been involved with on the south side. Um, but you can see, you know, we've aggressively on the bottom have <coughs> built a number of multifamily apartments and uh, in 2019 had a number of starts with uh, multi-family condos. So we've slowly um, are increasing that, although 56% of our homes in Sheboygan are, are single family and detached and built prior to 1980. So we've got an older housing stock, which isn't all bad because it also provides some affordable housing opportunities. But the development of new single family homes has remained relatively low while the multi-family units have significantly increased. So when we look at the rental market findings, I'm not gonna get into a ton of detail, but if you look at the rental unit mismatch chart on the top, what you'll see is that between 51 and 80% of the area's median income, there's a deficit of units in the, in the market, as well as over 80% AMI. There's another deficit in what, it doesn't mean we need 3,000 units, but it shows that we d definitely have the need for additional units in the rental housing market. Um, when you look at, 39% uh, of the housing stock in the city is rental units, and 50% of those rental units are considered affordable. So we have a good mix already of affordable housing. 33% of the renter households in Sheboygan are cost burden, and that's based on information pulled out of the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, and that shows that rental unit consumption chart on the right. Um, when you look at the amount of people that fall um, within the different uh, areas of the income. And then higher income households have been renting down in the market, so I think that's a key finding in that the people that can afford more 
don't necessarily have housing available at the higher rates, so they're going into the more affordable units. So what that means is if we develop some additional higher end housing, we could move people out of these and make them, more, make them available for lower income people. When we look at the rental unit vacancy, um, a typical average uh, finding for uh, vacancy rates is about 5%. And if you look at the city of Sheboygan's, we're at 3.3%. So there's definitely, uh, you know, that's another indicator of the need for additional housing units. Um, and that the other interesting thing about this is that subsidy will be needed to offset the construction costs. So the consultant has come up with the fact that it's about $1,300 a unit to build new housing. And if we're going to, if our goal is to try to develop housing that has a rent more affordable in the four to five to 600 range, that means that almost $800 of that development is gonna to have to be subsidized with some type of incentive. So whether it's TIF incentive or some kind of federal incentive, there's, you gotta to try to make up that delta and that's I think the challenge before us is how does one do that? So the consultant looked at the multifamily development example and uh, basically, uh, came up with this kind of chart to run through what the value and the cost would be. And you can see on the bottom, the break-even annual rent is about $15,590, and the break -even, the monthly rent is about $1,300. So based on the current construction costs and adding everything into it, um, you know, $1,300 is what it's costing to build these units. So. You know, if, if you want rents less than that, then you're gonna have to figure out how to fill that gap in the performa. And I think that's the challenge before us. When we look at the ownership market, um, property ownership primarily in single family homes, if you look at the mismatch chart again, you can see that there's a roughly 6,000 difference in units, so there's definitely an impact, a need for additional single family, we're all aware of that. Um, and in Sheboygan, the median household, House value is about 109,700, which is substantially less than a lot of other areas. Most current owners can comfortably afford their housing, is what they found in surveys and, and stakeholder interviews, and that there is a supply of affordable to lower income households, though most of those are owned by multi, moderate to higher income households. So again, in the ownership market, is the same thing we're seeing in the rental market, is that people are living in lower priced homes because frankly, that's what's available to them. So if there was an opportunity for some additional higher priced homes, the, the hope would be that those people would be willing to pay more and opening up opportunities in the more affordable units. So this is just some data from the single family home sales pulled by the MLS. And basically what you can see is that there has, sale prices are very aggressive in this market and we all hear that every day how properties are on the market for a few days people are paying more than they're worth more than they're listing them for so uh, single family homes is definitely um, good across the market so just looking at a, some of the demand um, doc numbers that the consultant has put together so the consultant believes that based on the vacancy rate and the occupancy rate and the other factors that the market can support another 401 to 1,023 apartment units or 40 to 102 per year by 2030. And you can see that um, they've kind of broken it further down into 184 to 471 at $918 a month, um, 112 to 287 at that roughly 1,000 to 1,400 a month and then 104 to 266 uh, at the greater than 1,284 a month. When we look at the owner-occupied units, 325 to 715 total by 2030 with about 33 to 72 per year. So that's gonna be very aggressive for us. The new subdivision going in on the south side is 134 lots, I think. So um, it'll take care of some of that need, but not a lot. And as we all know, we don't have a ton of land available for subdivision development. So we're gonna have to look at annexing additional lands, you know, from the towns to try to meet that need. And then under the, the piece that's really missing, I think is we don't, the, the, is the 55 and older 
housing. So we've got a lot of older people living in affordable or market rate housing and I've, I've run into those people where they've sold their house and they've just decided to move into these apartments because they don't want to have to shovel in those types of things. Um, if we could develop, if we had some developers that would develop some 55 and older homes that would be uh, housing that would be dedicated to that population that would help alleviate some of the usage in the other units and you can see from this they're projecting around a thousand five subsidized and 284 market rate and in independent living and then senior assisted living roughly 200 units by 2030. So really what we're focusing in on is what's the missing middle housing. So you have the detached single family housing, you have the mid rise and the higher end, but it's really this kind of workforce uh, affordable housing that falls within the middle. So condo ownership, senior housing, and three plus bedroom rentals are really what's the units that are needed and that the infill development is probably the way that a lot of this is gonna happen because frankly, we don't have a lot of expansion opportunities. So the recommendations that came out of the study um, are kind of laid out here, but I think you know a few of them, they're recommending the establishment of a housing committee um, to kind of oversee these efforts, um, continuing to grow our neighborhood associations, marketing city-owned properties, developing master plans, creating a tenant resource center, um, looking at some of our regulations, reducing setbacks and different things to continue um, building on the current housing, continuing the code enforcement program, and then looking at some partnerships with partners to kind of move some of these home ownership opportunities <coughs> forward. Um, funding, so you know that's always a big thing, you know, we, we get criticized when we put TIF into projects, but you know, frankly, the cost of the project and the rents just don't match in this market, so you have to look at TIF, but there is some opportunity for other funds. We established a new neighborhood revitalization fund, so expanding the use of that um, for affordable housing, and then looking at development of a workforce housing fund, similar to what Dane County does where employers actually fund um, stuff so it goes into a fund and, and, and employers provide some of the money and then promoting the use of uh, low income tax credit programs and other uh, programs. So in a nutshell, that's it. Um, on average, we need roughly 2,500 to 3,000 more units from what we are at today. And um, we have work ahead of us to find locations to do that and to make the numbers work, but um, there's, there's definitely a, a need for affordable housing, um, but I think there's opportunities to do so. And you know, and frankly, when you look at the 900 to 1300, a lot of the units that have been built kind of fall within those affordable housing units. That was you know one of the things that was surprising to me is that the consultant feel you know felt that based on 30 standards, are 30 percent of your income should go to housing. Um, you know, when you look at what people can afford in this market with higher paying jobs and things, that there is the opportunity for all different uh, size housing, you know, rents and, and, and home ownership from, you know, lower income all the way up to high income. So um, I don't think, you know, it's just going to be an affordable product. I think we have opportunity for all the products. Thank you for that presentation, Chad. Does anybody have any questions? Dave? Uh, Obviously, the study was completed before the explosion in, con in construction costs. Do you feel that that's really going to have a big impact on funding uh, this going into the future? Yes, definitely. I think, you know, we're already hearing it from developers that we're working with over the fact that um, the, the cost is through the roof. So they're, you know, they're now even talking how steel construction is cheaper than wood construction. So. I think they're gonna to have to look at all aspects of it, but yes, I think it's gonna drive additional, basically cost burden between the project to raising the prices. So rental rates are gonna to have to go up, right? I would More believe some of that, yes, some of it will, and if it's if it's intended to be a lower you know, income, they're gonna to have to figure out ways to you know, kind of fund that. We had a meeting with our legislators yesterday, and I brought up that you know, they're all talking about affordable housing, but here's some real numbers, even at $1,300 a unit, if your goal is to try to 
you know, exactly. s give it for seven, six, seven hundred dollars a unit, you've got a gap of six hundred dollars. So we're per unit, where is that coming from? The city can't afford to do that all ourselves. So we're gonna need some federal subsidies or state subsidies to help with that. Can't do it with a brat fry. <laughs> Um, yes, Jim, go ahead. Thank you. Do we need any kind of a motion from this committee to move forward with the We uh, do. Action. We need to recommend to the council to adopt the study and allow staff to start implementing it. I'll make that motion. Second. Thank you for that motion. Chad, uh, could you contrast the occupancy uh, with the pre previous study that was done, what, three years ago? Sure. There you go. Can I contrast it to the study that the EDC did? Yes. The EDC study that they did back in 2014 said that we could support 300 units a year for the next five years. So we, the numbers are very comparable to where, you know, they're looking at 400 units um, uh, on the low end uh, for the next, what, 10 years. So nine years so it's very comparable um, you know we've built about 800 so 800 plus units with Oscar um, so I think you know it's it's realistic to say that we could probably get another 400 to a thousand units given that we've got about a thousand units from 2015 to 2021 um, so it's very comparable to what the original projections were and I think back in that study there was a 1% vacancy rate that is correct. So at least we've we've gone moved we've up, gone up to two percent. <laughs> um, what about some of the uh, communities that you see uh, allowing a second home on a larger lot and in uh, allowing uh, additional development? Do we see that at all in the community? We talked about that. They they proposed this um, accessory dwelling unit where you'd have a second home on a lot. The problem is our lot sizes are so constricted now. Um, you know, we don't have the luxuries of large lots are, thanks Jim, our lots are, you know, 60 by 150 on average in the central city. So putting another property on the lot is, you know, is very difficult. So I, I, I don't know that that's the solution. Okay, thank you very much. Any other discussion? You want to call the roll? Sure. It, Mayor, it, Van, oh, Mayor Vandersteen? Aye. Um, Mayor Lynn Montemayor? Aye. Ryan Sazma? Aye. Don Svitan? Aye. Dave Huffman? Aye. All eyes. Motion passes. Uh, thanks for that presentation, and uh, we'll look forward to your implementation plan. Uh, our next uh, meeting is planned for April 27th. And I just wanna say it's uh, been a pleasure to work with all of you. Uh, it's been a, a, a great time seeing so many things and development happening in our community over the last eight years. And uh, you play an important role in making that happen in the approval process. So I wanna say thank you to everyone. Steve, you had something? Yeah, I wanted to say something as well. Um, obviously it's the mayor's last meeting and um, you know, Chad just went through the housing study and as part of the mayor's tenure and, and the board, a lot of the plan commission members, we've seen a tremendous amount of the multifamily housing that's been done. Um, there was discussion on the subdivisions and single family neighborhoods. One of the things that also got done was the annexation with Kohler. That's going to lead and uh, us to other opportunities for lands and farm fields that could provide for some of that single family housing. We are likely to get a championship Kohler golf course in the city. Um, the Memorial Mall has been, you know, redeveloped into a thriving mire and the corridor is really improving. Um, we've done things in terms of the South Point Enterprise Campus and a, a, a guaranteed industrial development for 10 to 20 years with that. Um, the mayor's also been involved in a number of things in terms of the bike p p 
pedestrian movements as far as the Taylor Drive improvements, the Shoreland 400 possibly extending that further south. Um, City Green is happening where we see, you know, hopefully we'll be out and get some more music and things like that downtown. So we've had some things happen downtown. The mayor participated in the Sheboygan River cleanup and uh, was leading the uh, by National Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, protecting the Great Lakes and cities along both Canada and the United States. So um, there's been just a number of things that happened during your time. And I think I speak on behalf of the Plan Commission when we say thank you for your service to our community. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, with that, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Thank you for your time today. Good job. Thanks much. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all. Yeah. 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 Yeah.